Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to session six. This is our last session of the day. And this session is titled, You Can't Access a Reference That Isn't There, Interventions That Promote the Persistence of Web-Based web Evidence in ETDs. This will be presented by Sarah Potvin, Kathy Anders, and Tina Bud Size Weaver from Texas A&M University Libraries, along with Martin Klein from Los Alamos National Lab Laboratory. My name is Ellen Amatangelo, and I'll be your moderator for the session. Um, a quick reminder to please keep your audio muted and your video off during the presentation portion, unless you are presenting or you're asked to participate. You can use the chat tab to ask questions, which will be addressed during the Q&A portion, and I'll monitor those questions as well in case anything comes in while the presentation is happening. Um, but yeah, I, that's that's all I have for my intro, and I will turn it over to the presenters. Great. Hi. Uh, let me go ahead and share screen. Into. Oh, sorry, Zoom is hiding my. Okay. Can everyone see my presentation? Yes. Great. So, hi, I'm Kathy Anders. I'll start by introducing um, us, all of us. Um, so, uh, we have a number of scheduling, holiday, <laughs> um, things come up. So I'm going to give a presentation on our behalf. Um, so Tina, Bud Size Weaver, Sarah Potvin, and I are all formerly of the Texas A&M University Libraries when the libraries had a big shift. Um, we moved into academic departments. So Sarah Potvin and I are in English. Um, and Tina Budsize Weaver is in the School of Performance Visualization and Fine Arts. And we have been working with Martin Klein, who is a computer scientist at uh, in the research library at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, this presentation is building actually on a presentation we gave um, I think two years ago, talking about reference rot. Um, so a little bit of background that Sarah Potvin formerly worked in digital scholarship. Tina Budsize Weaver was an, um, a subject librarian for performance studies, and I was the graduate studies librarian in the A&M libraries. So what we are here to talk to you today is about reference rot in ETDs. Um, and so we'll start by saying, what is reference rot? Okay. What is going on with reference rod in ETDs? Okay, so reference rod is a term that Dr. Uh, that Martin Klein, uh, working on some projects, helps to introduce, um, and it talks about two problems or kind of known issues uh, in web-based materials. So one is link rot, <laughs> basically where you go to a page and the thing you want isn't there, it's broken, right? Um, you get a 404 or something like that. And content drift, which is where you go to a page, but it's changed. So if we want to talk about both link rot and content drift, both of which are issues um, in, in web-based materials, uh, we talk about reference rot. So just to give an example of what we mean by rot. Okay, so this is an example of a page that has where the link has rotted. If you go here, you get a 404 error. Sometimes you get a custom 404 error, but whatever the page was, whatever the content of that page was, whatever was there is no longer there when you click on that link. Um, so that is broken. Drift, on the other hand, is where the link still resolves. It still takes you to a page, but that page has probably changed over time. So this was from um, an, an ETD we looked at, and this was a link to um, 
something called the Flock Disease Project, which I believe was a theater project for former um, for veterans. Um, and so this was the way it looked when the student was citing it or was when trying to get there. And this, if you go to the Flock to Tease projects today, is what it looks like. So it's an online gaming site. It's rather strange drift, but that's what happens. Oh, not gaming, gambling. Sorry, different <laughs> gambling, gambling site. Okay, sorry, I don't know what happened. All of my slides went forward. Nope, hang on, my bad. I don't know why it's going the wrong way. I'm gonna go real fast this way. Okay, so what are some of the concerns with this, um, with reference rot in ATDs and, and reference rot more broadly, right? Um, we might think that the citation is there and so, well, we know what it means. And if we think of citations as solely uh, for the purpose of giving credit to a source, um, then that's unfortunate, but it's not perhaps as concerning as it is if you think that you are losing records of and access to your sources and your data. So if you think of references as a collection of sources um, then that are being referenced in the scholarly work uh, and that there is some dependence of meaning between the scholarly work and the thing it's referencing, then losing access to that can be problematic. Um, if the source is not there, then, you know, people trying to review the work later or uh, work on reproducibility projects, um, their data is gone. And that's really an issue. Um, in some cases, there might not be another copy of the material. So I think a lot of times we think of web links as being kind of optional if they're to an article published in a journal or to a, a book, a Google book, because we think that there are archived online versions of that that are unlikely to break. Um, so sometimes that's true. However, sometimes that's not. Um, things on the web actually don't live forever. Uh, and so particularly if you're looking at research from marginalized populations, um, particularly ephemeral works like blog posts or uh, social media posts, there might not be another copy of of the source that is um, the source that's being cited, uh, and that leads to my fourth point. Okay. So, part of why we started looking at reference rot in eight, uh, in each of these, this our current project stemmed from a previous project, which was to see what was going on with reference rot in a and ETDs. And so Texas A&M is a very large school. <laughs> um, we have many, many students graduating each year. We're handling a very large number of, of ETDs coming through. Uh, and so when we, we, we couldn't run this analysis on all of the ETDs, but our, in our previous presentation at, at USEDA, we were talking at the time, we were in the middle of doing this analysis, I don't think we presented the results. What, what um, Sarah and Tina and I did was we looked at uh, our corpus of performance studies ETDs that were filed from 2012 to 2020. Um, and so we were trying to see which ones were perfectly functional in which the links linked to the thing that they seemed to indicate they wanted to go to and which ones suffered from reference rot. So um, about in that, in that set of ETDs, uh, about 26% of the links 
were rotted. They, they didn't result. They were just broken. Um, and uh, just over 20% had what we call diminished functionality, which means that they suffered from some sort of significant drift where they weren't uh, they weren't going quite to what seems to be indicated uh, in the citation. So that, and that, now this is an admittedly small, small sample size. I don't think we can draw conclusions about the whole corpus from that, but it was, there was more reference rot than we expected there to be. Um, so with about 52% of the links being perfectly functional over a relatively short period of time. Um, th this was, this seems significant to us. Now, what we see is that this is gonna continue to likely be a growing problem in ATDs. Um, this is an analysis of uh, all of our, um, uh, is um, an analysis of our entire publicly available ETB corpus. Some of our ETBs are not publicly available, but you can see that there's an upward trend of the number of URIs, um, which in, uh, includes a number of things, but our number of URIs that are in uh, ETDs being submitted over time. So we can see at the very end, when we get up to 2022, we have a pretty marked increase in the number of ETDs that are submitting, um, that have uh, URIs in them. So with that as a background, um, trying to understand you know what uh, what reference rod is I think we, we we felt like we established that it was an issue <laughs> in ATDs uh, Sarah Martin Tina and I decided to do a study to see what AM students knew about reference rod and whether or not they were concerned about it. So we ran two uh two two portions of our study and i'll just say that our our research was all irb from a m and uh, los alamos approved um we kept all of our information confidential only collecting demographic information about our students but no identifying information so we don't have any student numbers or names or anything like that so we did two things first one we did was we sent a broad survey to graduate students um, in February of 2023. This was just a large Qualtrics survey. And then the second part of the study was that we did two workshop interventions to try and teach graduate students about reference rot. And we did that in April of this year. We had it catered. It was about one and a half hours and we collected pre and post tests from the participants in those, uh, in those workshops. So um, I know we have a, I, I want to pause here for a second, actually, I meant to do this again. I know we have a Q&A session at the end, but I just want to make sure that I cover the topic of reference rot to folks' uh, comfort levels or understanding levels. Does anyone have any questions about what reference rot is? Is that a good answer? Not so much. So, okay. I'm not, I'm not seeing anything in the chat, but yeah. Okay, great. Good. Okay. Um, okay. So just some of our initial findings from the survey is that, uh, and I'm sorry, this is the text on the, on the side is small, but um, one of the things we found is that students are citing mostly web sources. So these are, they might have appeared in print at some point as well, but they access them through the web. So a huge, a huge number, a huge percentage of most or all of their sources coming from, um, coming from some sort of source that has a, has a URL. They got it through the web. 
students also know that like sometimes things break um not a not not all the time but a significant number of the students have at least at some point encountered some broken links they they know enough to know what they are when they've tried to uh, encounter something on the web on the web so a very small percentage has never encountered encountered a broken link um, or changed or otherwise become inaccessible. Like they, they can generally get to what they think they want to get to. So they both know that they are citing web sources and, or they both are citing web sources and they know or have had experience at least with encountering a broken link. But they have not thought about their links. Um, so even though they have this experience and they're doing this citing, uh, most of the students either haven't thought about it or expect that the resources that they cite will be available in five years of the same URL. So they're not, they're not necessarily taking what they thought about up there and coming in here. Now, I should say this was a very broad survey sent to, um, oh, I want to say around 12,000 or more graduate students. Um, so we picked graduate students at the College Station campus who, who filed ETDs. So we didn't include campuses um, like our dental campus or our law school, um, and we didn't include professional schools. So most of the filers are our ETs, but the, the, this broad student population hadn't really thought about what was gonna to happen to their sources. So that was our survey. And then we did this workshop. And part of our goal is to try and figure out how best to address this problem. Uh, so how do we make graduate students aware of this reference fraud issue? And then um, what do we think would be one way of addressing it? We could address it through um, getting graduate students to uh, better preserve their own works to, to make permanent link uh, options. Or uh, another option would be to automate uh, a system where where um, links are preserved. So when we did this workshop, trying to get a better sense of what students thought about these issues, um, we see this was a much smaller, much more specialized group. Um, we think some of these students came particularly because they were interested in the topic of reference rot and um, web permanency. So of the students who came to our workshop, uh, uh, more of them either didn't know or thought that web materials on the web were uh, permanent, but some did. And this is not exactly surprising given the sort of longstanding narrative that like nothing ever disappears from online when people are thinking about their own uh, online personas and uh, their own online reputations, so. Uh, after the workshop, so before we saw that the workshops raised some awareness because before uh, most students didn't consider or a significant number considered materials on the web permanent. But afterwards we have that the overwhelming majority of students see reference rot as an issue for your own scholarly work. So if you think back to our survey, when we were thinking about whether or not students thought that their own links might break, many of them didn't or didn't know. Uh, here we see after this workshop that they did. <laughs> uh, the students liked the workshop. They found it, or I should say they found it informative. Most students found it either, you know, somewhere in the range of very informative to somewhat informative with no one saying 
None. And I should say that these surveys were anonymous. We did not ask for any identifying information. We didn't know the participants. So uh, hopefully they weren't just trying to be nice. So, so a workshop might be one way of raising this awareness about, um, about reference law. However, <laughs> when we think about this, when we think about kind of our takeaways and our conclusions. Um, right, so when we think about take place, the first thing we noticed kind of just off the top is that it's really hard to get students to attend optional workshops. Um, right, so we we sent out recruitment emails for catered workshops to over 12,000 students with fewer than 30 attendees over two days. And this was like good catering <laughs> too from a very popular local ref uh, restaurant. Additionally, attendees had the option of getting credit for a graduate professional development certificate. So while we're sort of hopeful and we'd like to raise awareness and education around reference rot, um, issues involving reference rot, options for what to do um, to mitigate reference rot, um, get, getting students to come to workshops about it is difficult, uh, at least in our experience. Uh, when we asked students what they wanted, like and they said, we asked them sort of like, how would you like to deal with this? We had a very low sample sizes, I should say. This is not in any way, um, you know, definitive at all. Um, but we did ask students how they would like to have an intervention. Um, like, how do they think this would best be addressed? So the first option is talking about automation or tools. So having some sort of tool that will go through and archive all of your web links for you, either maybe in Vireo or the thesis submission process or some sort of like browser add-on or something like that. So they want automation and tools. Uh, another set wanted some sort of online guide or instructions, like uh, either a tutorial or a, a PDF or something like that online to tell them what to do. Um, the largest percentage wanted a workshop or class. Uh, now these are already students who are attending a workshop or class. So, you know, uh, that might already be their preference. And a couple express, expressed this sort of like non-specific desire just to get more education about this somehow. So as I was saying earlier, even though some students may want workshops, they may not be feasible. Um, so like we had just had an extremely low yield despite our free food. Um, and with at least 12,000 graduate students who are who are in plans that require the filing of an ATD, uh, workshops would be extraordinarily difficult to scale in any in any sense. Um, so the general idea is that even if we raise awareness, we're going to need some sort of tool for addressing reference rot. Um, and one of the things we're thinking about is how automated could that be and how might it be deployed to find the links? and extract the URL references from an ATD to mint a permanent link or an archival, or make an ar archival link um, through a number of services that do that. And then last step, put these persistent links back into ETDs, such that someone who's opening the file can get the archival link again. Um, so those are kind of the steps that are necessary. Um, and we're trying to figure out like, what would be the best way to do those steps? So um, part of what we wanted to do with this presentation was talk to y'all 
um, to see, to kind of, you are the thesis professionals. Um, and we'd like to have a conversation about um, if your office has the capacity to administer training or tools. Does this, does this seem like something that a thesis office could take on? Um, and we recognize, you know, there's, there are a variety of answers about that. Um, and then, you know, what would be helpful for you to address reference rot? Um, and do you think that's even something that your office should do? Uh, if it's not, if it's not there, you know, where where else might it be? Um, and then if anyone's interested, we're looking at trying to gather interest for future proposals. So can I, is it okay if I open it up for discussion? Um, sure, are you wanting people to just chime in or raise Yeah, them? that would be great. If people just unmuted and chimed in, that would be fantastic. Well, I have something to start off. Um, so I am the institutional repository administrator. Okay. And so I do feel some, I guess, responsibility for reference rot, but I don't know how to actually deal with it, I guess. I think I need my own workshop before I can train other people. Right. Okay. So a workshop like more training just about what reference rod is and options for dealing with it or something yeah, like that? Yeah, mostly like options for, for what we can do about it. Okay. Um, let's see, we got a chat. Same. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry. I went, I didn't need to go back. <laughs> Does, would anyone be willing to share? Like, do you think this is part of your wheelhouse? How would you find all the links in ET? Yeah, this is a question. This is one of the questions that uh we would have to address for sure there are softwares that can crawl and find them so it's possible to do it's just it's got a couple steps this is coming from the chat i'm an ir manager librarian too and i'd appreciate education on how to teach others about it and deal with it okay yeah sure like put together put together uh like a maybe a kit like a kit that has some background readings and presentation slides maybe something like that a kit would be great okay um I think this is an issue, but not sure who can fix it. Yeah, I hit in tools to be used. Okay. Um, yeah, I think this is part of our question too. Um, oh, you don't allow in document hyperlinks, but allow web addresses. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, we we actually just looked at web addresses in our study software would be best, more efficient. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, just it's just a, probably not going to scale. I think one of the questions is where where would this process or where would this kind of live? Like who who would be doing um, that? Would it be a library? Would it be a thesis office? Should it be the university itself? Where um, who 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 manages that? Who looks at that? And we're trying to get a sense from folks like, do you think that would be your library, your thesis office, something like that? I haven't looked into it in a few years, but archive.org and I supposedly does it of archiving whole sites. Yeah, so there are um there are a number of archiving services. It's getting all of the links archived. Um so they all kind of have pluses and minuses to them from permalinks to, um, you know, looking uh, at um, something like Internet Archive or a variety of archivers that, that do that. Um, there doesn't seem to be at the moment a good site 
for archiving multimedia. Um, so things like videos, that's hard to archive. You don't have, okay, sorry. Maybe if you have a thesis dissertation office, they would be able to handle these types of issues. We don't have such a thing at BYU and we don't have the manpower to be able to check out all the links that we need to do. Some colleges might check these things then we go. Yeah, I don't know that anyone actually is doing link checking in ATVs. Um, it's a it's a tall order. Okay, you have no, okay, small liberal arts, undergrad college here, it would fall on the advisors and the librarians for education on this advisors. You haven't thought about advisors. That's a good point. Um, we have no thesis office. So Tara automatically captures screenshots. Could those be part of the ETD IR package? Maybe. That's it. We, we've talked about Zotero. Um, one of the things I think sometimes we run into are copyright questions when we actually put images back in things. Um, so some things can get away with library issue, like library protections. So, um, but yes, doing something like making a Zotero add-on or something like that that could start minting those might be a possibility. Are we cutting edge on the topic? No, we are. Well, I won't, I won't say. So Martin is one of the reference rod experts. Um, he he really is at the uh, at the top of the reference rod game, so to speak. Um, there are some other really good resources out there. We have an article by Mascot and Botter, which I don't have in front of me the link to or the name of. Um, but they do really good work. We have an, an, art, an article coming out on that initial project that I was talking about in Performance Studies ETDs, which I think is coming out in 2024 in Portal. Um, so there are definitely people working on web archiving, for sure, and on reference rot. Um, and people have started looking at it in ETDs. It's just not giant. <laughs> I would appreciate the toolkit. Yeah, okay. So is it fair for me to kind of characterize this discussion as saying toolkit would be helpful for education, both for yourself and for other folks. Um, and that checking that, that some sort of tool, if this were going to be administered, some sort of tool would uh, do that. Yes, it is also a citation issue, which involves the disciplines. Sorry, I got distracted in my own thing. Absolutely. So part of this is if you have a citation system that doesn't require in, a, a link <laughs> or has said we're past links, um, that's an issue. Uh, and um, so there, there might not be a link to link to. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so hit a tool eventually, and then it sounds like a variety, there are just really a variety of responses in terms of um, like who, who, who does what at different institutions. Thank you everyone for that. I'm happy to just, oh, great. Would it be helpful to provide training for campus departments for doing the approvals? What stage of approvals? I mean, yes, but what, what like, are you talking about like, dessert, like ETD chairs or, um, the thesis office members themselves who are doing the approvals. Sorry, I'm going to chime in. Since I'm the moderator, I can speak, right? <laughs> um, so that was my question. I was just thinking, like, our, our campus departments have their own approvals that theses and dissertations go through. 
Would it be helpful if during that process, they double check links to make sure that they're valid? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's that helpful in the long term, but maybe upfront, it could help catch some of those that are not useful. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. I think actually, it's not just checking to see if the links are broken at the time, it's to mint an archival link and then put that archival link into the ETD so that someone can access it in the future. Because the, I mean, these links definitely break over time. So something that's there right when they're approving it, you know, in five years might not be there, but we need to get the archive, the archival versions of, we need archived web pages um, and archived web links. But I, I seriously that, that could be something that could go to committees. Me training, okay, I see. Okay, so you got a couple of steps. So it would be you training the librarians who would then go to the advisors and then go to like the best practices. So it'd be like a train the trainers trainer type model. <laughs> uh, So in terms of tools, like, because part of this is definitely raising awareness, education, but some of this is also giving people a tool to do this relatively quickly, because it takes a long time to archive all your links. You know, if you've got 150 references or something like that, then, you know, you're, you're sitting there on the internet archive a lot. Um, so if anyone is interested in developing a tool or thinking about a tool or something like that, let us know. <laughs> We're getting funding for uh, like a larger grant project. Yes, absolutely. So, so Elizabeth said, I think you might need a hierarchy of what might break. Links to actual journals would be less of a problem than sites. Yes, that is definitely true. Um, although I will say we were surprised by some of the things that broke. Um, part of it is a question about who, who's doing the archiving and maintenance, right? Like if librarians, if we're talking about journals where these things have been archived many times, then um, that's less of a problem. Because even if the link breaks, you can go find the article. Um, but there are other things that we thought would be more durable, like when we looked sort of down farther um, that were surprising. I mean, maybe it shouldn't be surprising at the moment, but government data was surprisingly breaky, <laughs> uh, surprisingly rot, reference rotted. Um, and so there is kind of a thought about what might, what might break. And in some cases, it's not even, I mean, there's sort of this, issue of links breaking and having a tool to do this on mass but then there's also even in some ways like the need to educate students about how to represent their sources in their work like if you're referencing a conversation or an interview or something like that like you might need to write in parts of that into your thesis um thinking about the way you describe things uh if they're particularly ephemeral Y'all have any questions for, for me that I can answer as we have, I think, six minutes left? <laughs> it almost seems like we need to archive on our eye. Ours, or is this too far fetched? Uh, I mean, our IRs kind of are archives, but do you need an archiving tool on your repository? Yes, no, that's not too fetched. That's exactly what we're talking about. Like, we need some sort of tool that crawls a document 
pulls out the the URIs, sends them over to something that mints the archived versions, and then puts those archival links back into the document. Yeah, yeah no, that is exactly what we're talking about. And it could go a couple of places. Like it could go into a citation manager software, like be an add-on for an open citation manager software, something like that. It could go into Virio, like whatever the submission system is. Um, if all of your works are getting stuck in an institutional repository, maybe there could be some sort of in-between step there. I don't know. But yes, that's the sort of that's the sort of thing we're talking about. Yeah, that's an option into Vireo supplemental files. Well, I will go to my thank you slide and say thank you. That was a really helpful discussion. I uh, like chatting with you all, having a chat of talking about, I guess. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you for all of your ideas. That is very helpful. Feel free to contact us too if you want to talk more. Thank you so much. That was very informative. A lot of things I hadn't thought about. So, and now I need to think about them. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so we are going to close out this session. This is our last session of the day, but we hope to see you all tomorrow um, at eight or sorry, eight o'clock mountain time. I'll just put that out there because I'm in mountain time and it's 10 o'clock Eastern. So please join us at the same link and we will see you all tomorrow. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>